of retaliation. Um, I think there's something inside of each of us in our human nature that we feel the need to retaliate when we are wronged. Uh, it happens even as a young person. Uh, I remember in my house growing up, um, if we hit one of our brothers uh, to avoid getting in trouble with our parents, you know what we would do? We'd make a, we'd make a deal with them. So we would tell our, the brother that we hit, uh, you can hit me as hard as you want uh, and you could pay me back. Just don't tell mom and dad. You remember those days? That was fun times. Uh, and and, and he, the thing is, is we, we, we were able to settle it because we knew if we could just feel better about it and hit the other person and get it out and retaliate that everything was fine and we could be corrected and everything was gonna, we were just gonna move on with it. Um, kids, please don't do that, okay? Um, and the kids in the room. But that's, that was kind of my house growing up. Uh, but there's something inside of us that um, we, 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 we like to think, yes, we have self-control, um, but we, we also want to retaliate when we are wronged and something has been done wrong to us. Uh, it's human nature. Although we practice self-control and all that, we, we, if you don't believe me, uh, just think about when you drive in traffic, right? If somebody's to cut you off in traffic, like you, the, the, the frustration, like there's something inside of you. It's like, I, if I could just veer in them without messing with my car, that'd be great. Like there, there's just this desire, this retaliation thing that just immediately kicks in that we want to be a part of, but we, we practice self-control. But according to the American Psychological Association, hopefully you practice self-control. Uh, according to the American Psychological Association, the, those that seek revenge end up feeling worse than those that have already moved on from the hurt or the pain. Think about that for a moment. That, that if we, we have this natural desire inside of us for retaliation to, to get back when we have been wronged and something has been done wrong to us, we want to make it right and make them feel the same pain that we have felt. But that's our sinful nature. And we know, uh, we know that sometimes when we retaliate and we, when we, re, we re, react and we try to get revenge on somebody else, we know that it's going to make our life a little bit worse than it was before. So today as we're we're going to look at probably one of the most controversial passages in the entire Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. It's one of the most controversial because it flies in the face of our culture. It flies in the face of um, more than likely just uh, it, there's a big part of Southern culture here that we're going to kind of see Jesus go after a little bit. Um, and Jesus is going to address how we are to respond when we are wronged. All right. So hope you're ready for this. Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at verse 38. It says this, you have heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This is a Southern translation. It says, if anybody slaps you on the cheek, you hit them harder than they hit you, right? <laughs> Verse 40, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to him the one who begs from you. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Typically, um, what happens in this passage is that many have taken one portion of this passage and really taken it out of context. And I, I would venture to say that people that are not even Christ followers or maybe not even have read the Bible before would look, look at it and say, I, I understand, I know this one part of this verse is it uh, to turn the other cheek, right? It's, it's pretty common knowledge. It's pretty common phrasing in our culture. Turn the other cheek. We want to be the bigger man or the bigger woman and turn the other cheek and have self-control. But Jesus is saying something bigger than just turning the other cheek, and it's, but it's just as radical. And so I'm excited to dive in. Here's the main idea if you're taking notes, is that as people of the kingdom, Jesus invites us to a better way of justice. As people of the kingdom, Jesus invites us to a better way of justice. Now, if you were to think back to whenever you've been wronged, um, typically uh, people that really want to get retribution or retaliate towards somebody, it's because they, they have a strong sense of justice. They want justice to be done. They want justice to be enacted on somebody. But Jesus here in this passage, what we're gonna see is Jesus is calling us not to enact justice on our own way, but to find a better way to enact justice. Let's look at verse 38. And you have heard it said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, with many of the, uh, you have heard it said, or what the scholars call the antithesis statements that we've been going through, there's six of them here that we're looking at. You have heard it said, but I say, 
Uh, you have heard it said that, uh, and, and Jesus kind of gives this dichotomy between what the, the Old Testament scriptures, the, the Hebrew Bible would say, and they're saying, and Jesus dives further and deeper into the conversation and says, but I say to you this, um, we understand and we know now as we've been going through this passage uh, that God is not, re- Jesus is not replacing the Old Testament. He's not doing away with the law. He's trying to get to the heart of the law that was originally intended. Um, now with all of these statements, we usually have a specific verse to go back to, but this one um, uh, in the Old Testament usually points back and it's like a direct quotation. This one, Jesus is giving more of an idea or a, um, a compilation of ideas of some Old Testament laws. Uh, the idea of retribution or right punishment, equal punishment, is all throughout the scriptures. One example is found in Exodus chapter 21. This will be on your screen this morning as well. And this is what it says, verse 23 through 25. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. There's this idea of uh, uh, tooth for tooth, eye for eye, harm for harm. This is um, really a justice issue when we think about it. In any society, um, we have uh, laws that are to to keep justice and to make things right and to keep people to obey uh, uh, moral uh, law and kind of bring character to our our nation, right? We have those things that are, are drawing people to live rightly and to treat each other with kindness, to not steal, to not murder, to not, uh, to not hurt or harm people. But in any society, they have what is called a commensurable punishment, punishment which basically means, um, does the punishment fit the crime? Does the punishment fit the crime? Think about that for a moment. Does the punishment fit the crime? Israel's law included both capital, cap, capital and corporal punishment. Life for life or harm for harm. This is uh, in the Latin, it's called the lex talionis, uh, which is the, it translates as the law of retribution, equal punishment for equal crime. That's why, uh, you know, like we talked about the pinky promise thing last week. Like uh, it, the, the, the origins of it being like, if you break your promise, we're gonna chop your pinky off because you broke e- e- equal, equal punishment for equal crime. That's the idea that uh, is, is Jesus is going after here in this, in this idea. Um, that's why we, we, in all of our cultures, we have this. And the reason that we get upset whenever somebody in our world um, doesn't get held accountable, somebody that's rich or powerful or famous, politician, right? We see them break all kinds of laws that normal everyday folks would be, uh, they'd be in hard prison doing hard time, but they end up getting like six months in a posh like private place where they get to play ping pong all day. And you're like, how does this work? Does it feel like equal punishment, does it? That's why we, we kind of have this push towards like, we, we want people to feel pain for the things that they have done. And that's not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily wrong, but we get upset when somebody isn't punished to the standard that they were harmful towards somebody. And I say all that to say this, is that God is a God of justice. God is a God of justice. And he will... He, all throughout the scriptures, you read the Old Testament, all throughout the scripture, God is sticking up for the oppressed. He's sticking up for those that are harmed, those, uh, and he's bringing justice to the oppressor. And so Jesus in this passage, what he is not doing is he is not, he's not doing away with justice. He's not saying, don't hold people accountable. Jesus is not saying that we need to live this life in this world that that no one is uh, judged for what they do. That is not what Jesus is going after here but he does want his followers, us as kingdom people, to see justice in a different light. Um, For context, let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 19. It'll be on the screens. This is what the law says in Deuteronomy. It says, your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, or foot for foot. Sounds familiar, just like Exodus, right? But in Deuteronomy, what does it say in the beginning of that verse? It says, you shall not have pity. Your eye shall not pity. The law called for people not to show mercy or pity in their punishment. We can't, what the idea was is that you, you, you can't, somebody can't do something to you and then you see them crying and it's like, oh, all of a sudden, it's like, well, let, let's just not, let's not worry about it. Let's let them get away with it. 
You had to not show pity in that way and you had to enact justice to that person. But God is, Jesus is saying, yes, justice matters, but so does mercy. Justice matters, but so does mercy. And he's trying to get, get us to not live without, without showing pity. We think about the words of Jesus as he's going throughout the Sermon on the Mount and all throughout the gospels, Jesus is full of mercy. He's full of pity as he sees people. And he's, he's saying, yes, you can hold on to justice, but you can also be merciful at the same time. Or as James chapter two, verse 13 says it, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the idea that Jesus is hinting at here is that we can't walk around with pitchforks uh, wanting to crucify everybody that does something wrong towards us while, uh, while also at the same time wishing that everyone would be gracious and merciful with us when we make mistakes. Jesus is trying to get us to see you can hold people accountable and justice can be enacted, but you can still be merciful to those around you. This is, this is, it's really a tension. We were sitting at the dinner table last night and um, I was asking our kids these questions like, what does it mean to, to be merciful in a way? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to word it in their way, but what does it mean to be merciful, but also that God's gonna, be, God's gonna hold people accountable. There's gonna be justice. What does that look like for us? And there's this tension that we feel because at times it feels like th- that they're on both, they're on either side of the road, right? They're in ditches on either side of the road. And you either have to be a person of justice or you have to be a person of mercy. That's not the reality. And that's what Jesus is calling us to find this middle way, this third way. Scott McKnight, author, scholar says it this way, is that Jesus reveals that grace, love and forgiveness can reverse the dangers of retribution and even more create an alternative society. Jesus reveals reveals that grace, love and forgiveness can reverse the dangers of retribution. We want justice to be enacted, don't we? We want people to pay for their sins and to be held accountable. We want those things. We, We desire those things. But Jesus is saying, you don't have to not show mercy. You don't have to live in this life to where it's like, it's all justice and no mercy or all mercy and no justice. As we move through the rest of this passage, Jesus is gonna give us these four examples of real life situations on how we are to resist evil or wrongdoing. And on the surface, these examples, they may seem like that we are being called as followers of Jesus to be a a punching bag or a a doormat for society. It's kind of the, the, the idea that you kind of hear it and you see it and it's like, wow, like we're supposed to just let people take advantage of it of us. Like that's, that's what Jesus is calling us to. We might call it in our world pacifism. Somebody's at your front door, right? <laughs> we might call this on our own terms like pacifism that, that many God loving people have turned this into or have translated this passage into pacifism. Like there is, there's never a place to protect your family. There's never a place to protect yourself that, that you're just supposed to take whatever happens to you because it's the Lord's will. I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at here. I believe though, that it's somewhere in between, which hints at a a third way that we can't ignore the words of Jesus here. That he calls us to to live differently than our culture has said to live when it comes to retaliation or retribution. Many Many have ignored this in an act to seem tough or to project bravado, but Jesus isn't calling us also, he's not calling us to be abused at the same time. So, Let's look at this first example, verse 39 in chapter five. It says, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This is the one that everybody loves, isn't it? This goes so much of what many of us were probably taught growing up. If you grew up in the South, you probably heard something like, uh, never start a fight, but if somebody hits you, you better finish it right? That's kind of the, the, the thing, like the theme in the underground. It's like, you never started, but you better finish. You better not come home with a black eye. Like, what? Like you, hear, you have your parents are telling you this, but then you read the scripture and you're like, who do I choose? What do I do? Like, is, is this culture went out or scripture went out? I believe what, as we, as we look at this, what Jesus is trying to get at is he's trying to take private vengeance out of our hands. See, we, we tend to see laws as restrictive, but the commands and the laws of God are not restrictive, they're protective. 
And God is trying to protect us from doing double harm. And it's like, you, you see it all the time. Some, some, if there's something in our culture, in our world where somebody goes and gets revenge, their family gets torn up even more because that person's gonna be in prison as well. And Jesus is trying to protect us. He's like, listen, you don't have to do that. You can, you can live your life in such a way that justice is gonna be enacted, but you don't have to go seek out revenge and take it, on your own, take it into your own hands. See, much of uh, what, the, what I'm gonna talk about today comes from a theologian. Uh, his name is Walter Wink. What a cool name, Walter Wink. Uh, I've been studying this passage because I, this is one of those passages that as you're planning out, this theory, planning out the series, you're looking at it and you're thinking like, nope, don't wanna do that one. Uh, I, Brian wasn't available to speak, speak this week. Uh, he did divorce a couple weeks ago. I should have given him this one too, right? Because it goes against what we feel in our culture. It's like, we wanna stand up, we wanna fight back and do all the things because we're men and women and we're tough and we gotta make it happen, right? But as I stated already, this is one of those ideas that makes it look like and feel like we're to be doormats and pillows for the abused, for the abuser. We're just to take the abuse, but I don't, I don't see how a God who stands continually for the broken, the oppressed, the, 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 the left out, um, the sojourner, the, place that ha- the, pers- the p- person that has no home, uh, that, that God would see that he stands up for those people all throughout scripture. And then in the New Testament, all of a sudden he's saying, you just need to deal with it. You need to suck it up. I don't think that's what Jesus is calling us to, but he is calling us to something. Um, during the first century, it was still very common in this time um, to own slaves. Uh, now slaves, as the, as the nature of that evil is, slaves were always seen, have always been seen as less than. They've always been seen as less than a person, lesser of a person, maybe so. And with that in mind, I want us to pay special attention to the words of Jesus here. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek, the left cheek. Um, can I steal you, Bailey, just for a second? Come on up here, Bailey. Um, um, I'm not gonna slap you because you could beat me up, but um, nobody needs to see that. Uh, but if any, it says, if anyone's to slap you on the right cheek, turn to him the, the left cheek. I'm not sure why. If you're left-handed in the room, I'm sorry, but you always get left out of everything, right? Um, this is a right-handed dominant society culture and right-handers are always right, all right? So if, if you were to slap somebody and I'm right-handed, right-handed dominant, I'm, I'm looking at Bailey. If I'm gonna slap him on the right cheek, what do I have to do to be able to slap him? I have to backhand him, right? I'm not gonna do it, I promise, I promise. Um, it's not gonna happen, but I have to backhand him. Why? Why, why, would, why would somebody be backhanding somebody to the left cheek? Because this is how in the first century, how a slave owner would treat their slave as a person that's lesser. They weren't worthy of the open hand. Because if I'm to slap somebody on the right cheek or on the left cheek with the open hand, what I'm saying is I am slapping my equal. And Jesus says, if somebody treats you as a slave and you slap them with the backhand, you turn them the the left cheek as well. Because I want you to show them, I want you to show them that that you are their equal. You see the difference here? Jesus is not just saying, like, just take a beating and lay down and don't, don't, don't do anything to protect yourself or your family. But he's saying, if somebody is to slap you as a lesser, turn to him the other cheek so they have to treat you as their equal as well. You sit down. Thank you, Bailey. As you backhand somebody, it's they're, they're lesser. They're, they're less than and what Jesus was saying is that if you turn to them your other cheek, they have to treat you as their equal. And if they slap you on the face as your equal, it, it would in turn bring shame upon the abuser. You gotta think in this time and in, in specifically in this first century Palestinian culture, um, it was a big honor and shame culture. Honor, being a person of honor was of great importance. I mean, it it held so much weight in life. They wanted to do nothing to mess up the honor of their life and their family's life. And so if you were to slap a person open-handed on the left cheek and equal, you would bring shame to you and your family. Something else to consider here is that Jesus mostly associated with the people that would be considered lesser of the culture. Scholars agree that there would have been slaves more than likely present at the time of Jesus' teaching. 
So I want you to think about the, the dignity that Jesus is bringing to the people here. He says, when you, you as a slave are backhanded, you turn him to the other cheek, and I want you to show that slave owner that you are equal to them. Think about that for a moment. How, there's so much beauty in the words of Jesus. He's not saying to do it in a way that lets the abuser off the hook. What he's saying is, he's saying do it in a way that shows the shame to the abuser. And sometimes you may find yourself in a situation in this life that may mean that you are to not retaliate. That may mean that you get hit in the face and you don't respond. And I know that brushes up against what many of us have been taught in our culture. But here's the good news is that Jesus isn't asking us to do something that he hasn't already done. And there's strength in that. Isaiah chapter 53, verse seven. He says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't even use his words to respond to the people. Like a lamb that was led to the, like the, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter uh, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He did not retaliate. And there may be a time in your life where the best response to being you, the best response to you being afflicted or shamed is to turn the other cheek. It is to not fight back, to be silent. And as hard as that sounds, but Jesus shows us the way. Let's look at verse 40, the second example that he gives. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Um, we have this saying in America, when somebody is just a good person, like you, you know those people that they, they'll just do anything for everybody. You know what they say? That person would give you the shirt off of their back, right? They, they'd give you everything just to help them out. It's a, kind of this idea of they're just a good person. Now, some definitions I think that'll probably help when you think about tunic and cloak and what does all this mean? A tunic uh, was like an undershirt <clears throat> uh, worn close to the body. A, a, a cloak was an outer garment. Uh, it was meant, uh, meant to keep you warm, kind of a, a status symbol, but uh, much like today, but in a more serious sense, is it the clothing that a person would wear in the first century in the Hebrew culture uh, was really uh, to identify who they were as a person. Um, and, our, and ours is a little bit more superficial, right? You might look at somebody, what they're wearing and say, oh, they like outdoor sports or they like, they like a certain team or they like a certain activity. Like what, they, what they, people wear, we can kind of look in our culture and it becomes their identity or they're really into fashion. Yeah, they're really into shoes like Leo, Jordans, or whatever it is. Thank you, Leo. But in our, our times, as we think about the identity, a cloak in the first century is more than that. It was, it was used for their identity, yes, but it was also what would keep a person warm at night. It, it was their identity, but it also was what uh, allowed them not to get sick all the time. It was this, uh, this idea of protection. It was this outer garment that they wear to kind of, in the middle of the night, if, if you were to go to the Middle East, it, it, in, the middle of the, in the middle of the night, it gets cold. And so they're living without shelter and they're traveling. They're making all these journeys and they take their cloak and they wrap up with it just to, just to stay warm in the middle of the night. And so Jesus was saying, when somebody sues you for the shirt off of your back, is to give them your cloak as well, your outer garment. I want you to think through this for a second. If your undergarment is taken in court and you give your outer garment to the person, what's left? Nothing. Your nakedness, right? You're, you're, you're gonna be naked. I say that word really funny, naked. Naked, I'm sorry, however you say it. All right, leave me alone. I'm insecure about it. If they take your, your, under, your, your, your shirt and then you give them your outer garment, there's nothing left to, 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 to show. Like there's nothing left to cover up. You're showing your nakedness to your abuser. And in the Hebrew culture, when, someone was, when you saw someone naked, um, it wasn't, um, I'm, gonna, I'm really struggling to say that word every time now because y'all are gonna really pay attention. I should have just not mentioned it. Naked, thank you, naked. Naked. I'm gonna practice it, Francois. The person from South Africa is giving me English lessons right now. <laughs> this is a problem. Francois. Okay, all right. 
But here's the thing in the Hebrew culture, when, when you saw someone naked, the shame wasn't on the person that was naked. In our culture, if somebody was to see you naked, it's like, oh my gosh, like, I'm so embarrassed. Like, oh my, you have to, it's like, right, the shame's on us, right? In their culture, the shame is on the person that saw the nakedness. We see this illustrated with Noah, Genesis chapter nine, verses 23 and 25. Through 25, it says, the, the sons of Noah, then Shem, then Shem and Japheth uh, took a garment. Remember, Noah had too much to drink that night. Horrible, right? He's drunk and passing out, laying naked in his, in his tent. Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and they walked backwards to cover the nakedness of their father. Why would they walk backwards? Why not just walk in? I'm gonna cover up my dad. Like, nobody needs to see that. They walked backwards because if they were to see their father's nakedness, the shame was on them. When Noah awoke from his, from his wine and he knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, curse be to Canaan, a servant of servants shall, be to, he, shall he be to his brothers. The shame was on the youngest who had saw the nakedness and did nothing about it. It wasn't on Noah, but it was on his son. And so Jesus calling his followers to give a tunic wasn't simply about just being more nice to your abuser. Like if you get sued for your shirt, give him your clone. It's not just about niceness. What it was is to make, make known to the world around you that this person has taken advantage of just somebody else. It was to bring to light the injustice of the other party. Uh, this is what Walter Wink calls a third way of nonviolence. Like you're gonna sue me for the shirt off my back Naturally, we'd wanna do something to get that person back. But Jesus says, no, why don't you take your cloak off as well and reveal your nakedness in them to them so that they see their shame and the entire community sees the shame that they are in as well. There's a way to not be a punching bag, but also not let violence be our first response when wronged. It may not be easy. It takes a lot of self-control but it's the way of Jesus. Let's look at the third example that he gives. He says that if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, I know this, this sounds crazy, but there are actual people out there that enjoy running. They're crazy people, right? Yeah. Um, I run out of necessity. But if you don't run, let's just say that you don't run, you, you don't enjoy it, you don't, you don't run ever. If you were to try to run for a mile, um, you wouldn't make it very far, right? You're, you're not gonna be able to run very far without having to stop or lay on the concrete on the side of the road and take a breather. Like there, 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 there's a difficulty because a mile is a pretty long way. But you know, it's, you know what's even more depressing than that? Is that when you run a mile and you look at how many calories you actually burned when you ran, you're like, that's it? It's frustrating. It's nothing to do with my message. I'm just frustrated about that. <laughs> he says, uh, th this example that Jesus gives, it seems a little bit weird. This, my, who's gonna force somebody to, to walk a mile? Um, remember the Jews are living under Roman control, Roman control at this time. And there is a, there was a, at this time, there's this random Roman rule uh, that any Roman soldier could, could pick a, anybody that was 12 years old and up, a Jewish person, and they could force them, force that person to carry their pack for at least a mile. It was, it was a random rule. There's no meaning behind it. It's other than it was just to show their force over the people of Israel. I'm gonna show my force to you and make you carry my pack for a mile. No other reason. I just want you to know who's in control. Here's what's interesting about that. Um, in this pack was all kinds of things like cooking utensils and food rations. Um, they were heavy. They weren't light. Think about a 12-year-old boy having to carry, a 12-year-old girl having to carry this heavy pack for up to a mile just because. And they could force you to do it for a mile, but anything beyond a mile was considered to be an injustice. Why? I have no clue. Like, why did they just choose a mile? They just chose a mile. But anything beyond a mile was considered an injustice. And then the soldier could be open to judgment and, and discipline beyond that. And so when Jesus says, if anybody forces you to go to a mile, I want you to go another mile. Why? It's what we've seen over and over with these statements that Jesus is giving. Is he's trying to let us see that we need to point out what our abusers are trying to do to us. We need to show the world the shame of somebody that is taking advantage of you. 
So if anybody forces you to go to mile, go a second one so that they feel the weight of their abuse. You show them that you're not affected by their abuse or their power because you belong to another kingdom. Verse 42. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse to the one who would borrow from you. This, now, this one is not about revenge, really, um, but it's really about how we treat others that may be seen less in our culture. Um, Jesus is looking for his followers to be givers without condition. But what do we do in our world, right? Because, uh, and, you know, inflation's up and the cost of everything's up and gas prices and all the things, like the uh, cost of building a home and all, the, all these things in our world, it's more and more and more and more. It's more expensive to live. And so we get a little bit more tighter with our resources, don't we? It's like, okay, it's time to hunker down and, and make it through this season. And so what we end up saying is things like, I will give to you if you do this. I'll give to you if you can accomplish this. But Jesus says, no, I, I want you to say, I'll, I'll give to you because God has already given to me. To not give with condition, not give with um, stipulations. Notice that it doesn't say that we are to give exactly what someone's asking for. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we're unwise with our resources. It doesn't mean that we just walk around. It's like, hey, you can have everything that I have and now I can't pay my house payment. That's not what Jesus is saying. But the idea is, is that we can all give something and if we have it, then we need to give it. There's one of my um, favorite follows on Instagram is this, his, I don't even know his real, I don't know if his real name, but his Instagram name is Jimmy Darts. And um, he has a huge following, he's a uh, you know, influencer, and uh, he, I think he lives in California, but he has his, his followers ask him, these, tell him to do these random things. Walk up to a random person, and the first person that gives you a, a bottle of water, give him $500. And now, now companies like Cash App and all these other companies are sponsoring him and, and allowing him to do this because it's, it's been so viral. And he'll walk down the street in a neighborhood, um, maybe a low-income neighborhood, and he'll walk in these streets, and he'll say, hey, uh, do you have a bottle of water that I could have? It's really hot out here. No, no, no. And he'll get the first person that says yes and he takes the water from him and he gives him the $500. The, the reaction of the people is just like, it's amazing. If you have Instagram, I encourage you to go follow him. What does it look like for us to be people of radical generosity to those that in our culture would be seen as less than? I mean, I know, I know for me, I, I'm being very transparent here. You drive up to a red light, there's people begging on the side of the street. What's, what's our first response? Lock the door, turn the music up, and look forward, right? It's like, that's our first response. And I'm not saying that we just, I don't think Jesus is saying give to everybody and any, anything. Like, I don't think that's what he's saying. But if there's somebody begging, somebody needs something, you have it. Be a person of radical generosity. Even if we don't have the resources, we can still give a kind word of encouragement, a word of prayer, kindness. What matters to Jesus is how people who call themselves followers, how we carry ourselves in our world. Are we looking for revenge? Are we looking to retaliate? Are we looking to, to push back on people that may push back on us? Are we giving to those without, without a stipulation, without requirement? We're, what this really all boils down to is, I heard it said this way, another pastor said it this way about this passage, is how good of a neighbor are you? Do we really love our neighbor? Do we really love those around us? Do we wanna get revenge or do we wanna get reconciliation? Because revenge and reconciliation are usually at odds with each other. Revenge might feel better in a moment but reconciliation is what Jesus calls us to. Let me give you an example. Let's just say your neighbor is mowing the grass um, and his lawnmower hits a rock, right? And it shoots out and it hits your vehicle window and busts out your window. Now, you, you have a couple options, right? You can go talk to that person, have a civil conversation, or you can be radical and you can take a baseball bat and start busting out their windows because they did it to you and I'm gonna do it to them. Do we 
Do we treat people with kindness and respect even when something happens that we don't like? One may make you feel better in a moment, but it's not the way of Jesus. What he's trying to get us to see is that there's a better way. We think in our minds and our humanity and our sinful nature that if we will um, respond to things that happen to us when we're wronged, that we're gonna feel better about them. And Jesus says, no, it's not gonna make you feel better. You're gonna put yourself in a worse situation more than likely. What he's trying to get us to see is that we don't have to respond in violence so we can work towards reconciliation with those around us. And we don't have to enact justice with our own hands because God is the ultimate judge. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 21. It says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, right? If it is possible, sometimes that, that's not possible. Somebody doesn't want to live at peace with you, but if at all possible, live peaceably with all. Beloved, Follower of Jesus, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil, but, become, but overcome evil with good. This is the same idea that Jesus has been hinting at in this passage, is that when you respond in love and care and mercy, you don't respond in anger and physical harm, that you are gonna heap coals onto that person's head because they're gonna realize their shame as an abuser. Now, I wanna give a very clear distinction here. What this does not mean is that if you are living in some kind of abusive relationship that you just need to suck it up and deal with it later. That is not what Jesus is saying. That is not the heart of God. But what he is saying is that when, when people harm you, do wrong against you, do you want reconciliation or do you want revenge? What this really boils down to is faith. Do you have faith that Jesus is gonna do what he said he would do? But when we take justice and revenge in our own hands, I would venture to say that we're not acting in much faith as people of the kingdom, Jesus invites us to a better way of justice. Just you bow your heads with me this morning. Jesus, um, as he so willingly did, he, he took his beating silently, as it says in Isaiah, so that you and I could have the opportunity to be, opportunity to be reconciled to him. so that we have right relationship with the Father. And what he was doing in that moment, if he was showing us a better way, he was showing us that as you, ha as you have been reconciled to God, I want you to be reconciled to others. I want you to think for a moment this morning as we close. Think about all the things that you have done towards God, sin in your life, choosing other gods, choosing our careers over him, choosing uh, situations over him, choosing um, sinful desires over his way. If anybody had the right to get revenge towards, this would be the Lord, wouldn't it? What Jesus is trying to get us to, say, get us to see is that as you have been reconciled to the Father through my work, I should be reconciled to those around you. 